Hello everybody again. I hope you are very, very well wherever you are. Today I have on the magic shelf this. This is the hypnotism book that Molly found in the library. Here you will see that it has all sorts of drawings inside it. It's got lots of lessons inside it too about how to hypnotize people. Hypnotism, an ancient art explained by D. H. Logan. This is the book that Molly Moon finds. I'm going to put it back here for you to look at and I'm going to carry on reading from Molly Moon's incredible book of hypnotism which is the story about how Molly finds a book on hypnotism in a library and how her life changes. We have got to chapter four. So I'm going to read you chapter four. Here we go. With growing excitement, Molly walked back through the outer streets of Briarsville and across the uphill fields to the orphanage. It had stopped raining, but even so, she had the hypnotism book wrapped tightly in her anorak. It was only tea time, but already the grey November light was fading. Pheasants chirruped loudly in the woods as they settled to roost, and rabbits darted for cover as Molly walked by. When she arrived at Hardwick House, the windows of the stone building were already aglow from lights within. Behind the thin curtain in a first floor window, Molly could make out the wizened silhouette of Miss Addiston as she petted her bad-tempered pug dog, Petula. Molly smiled to herself and pushed open the iron gates. As she walked quietly across the gravel, the side door of the orphanage opened. It was Mrs Trinklebury. She th threw her plump arms around Molly and hugged her. Oh, hello, Molly Poppet. You're back. At least I didn't m m m miss you completely. H how are you? All right? Yeah, just about, said Molly, giving her a hug back. Molly would have loved to tell Mrs Trinklebury about the book, but she decided it was better not to. How are you? Oh, good as ever. Bit of trouble with her hazel just now. But what's new? Look, I saved you a cake. Mrs Trinkleby reached into her flowery knitting bag and rummaged about. Here you go, she said, passing Molly a grease-proof paper package. It's a ch 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 chocolate fairy cake. Made some last night. The glass in her spectacles flashed as they caught the light coming from the hall. But, but, but don't let Miss you know who catch you with it. Oh, thank you, said Molly appreciatively. M -m Must be going now, dear, she said, pulling her old crocheted coat tightly around her, doing up its flowery buttons and kissing Molly. Keep warm, Chuck. See you in a week. And with that, Mrs Trinklebury set off for the road into town and Molly went inside. She nipped up to her bedroom and since everyone else was at tea, had time to hide the book and the fairy cake carefully under her mattress. Then she went down to the dining room and sat by herself at the small table by the fireplace. Molly usually had tea with Rocky, but this time he wasn't there to ward off trouble. She ate her bread and margarine, warily watching Hazel at the large table on the other side of the room. She was showing off because she'd won the cross-country race. Hazel's beefy legs were covered in mud. Her big face was still red from all the exertion and she'd stuck a leafy twig into her black hair like a feather. Molly knew that when Hazel saw Molly alone, a bullying session would begin. And the usual escalation of nastiness would take place. Hazel would make a few vicious comments Molly would pretend not to care. Hazel's taunts would become more malicious until she pierced Molly's shell. Molly might blush or her face might twitch or worse, she might get a lump in her throat and her eyes might water. 
It was very difficult for Molly not to let her confidence crack when Hazel and her cronies ganged up on her. Quickly, Molly stuffed the last piece of her bread into her mouth and prepared to leave. But she was too late. Hazel spotted her and shouted coarsely, Look, everybody, Zono's finally made it. Did you fall in a puddle, Drono? Or was there a frog in the path that frightened you? Or did your weird, spammy legs snap? Molly smiled sarcastically, trying to shake the insults off. If that's supposed to be a cool smile, asked Hazel with a sneer. Look, everybody, bogey eyes is trying to look cool. Molly hated Hazel, although she hadn't always. She'd felt sorry for her to start with. Hazel had arrived at the orphanage four years ago, age six. Her bankrupt parents had been killed in a car crash, leaving her nothing, not even relations. And so, alone and destitute, she'd been sent to Hardwick House. Molly had done her best to make Hazel feel welcome, but very soon she'd realised that Hazel didn't want her friendship. Hazel had pushed Molly up against a wall and explained to her that she was better than her. She had known a wonderful family life and she remembered her parents. She hadn't been dropped like rubbish on a doorstep. She'd come there because a tragic twist of fate had killed her loving parents. With lots of stories about her fancy past, Hazel was a glamorous figure amongst the other children. But to Molly and Rocky, she was hard and poisonous. For four years, Hazel had teased, taunted and bullied Molly. For some reason, Hazel hated Molly. And now Molly loathed Hazel back. I said, is that supposed to be a cool smile? repeated Hazel. The four big children near Hazel sniggered. Cynthia and Craig, the podgy twins, and Gordon Boyles and Roger Fibbin, who were Hazel's special sidekicks, were all weak characters, too weak to ever stand up to their leader. They loved to watch her bully Molly. Greasy-haired Gordon Boyles sat on Hazel's left, wearing his bandana and clenching his fists. Since he had tattooed each of his fingers using a compass and ink, the fingers on his left fist read Gord and on his right fist read King. G-O-R-D-K-I-N-G. From where she was sitting, Molly could just read King Gord. As Gordon took a bite of his tea cake, Molly was reminded of his trademark trick of taking a fresh slice of bread and blowing his nose in it, making what he called a snot sandwich, which he'd then eat. He had a revolting imagination, and if paid, would do just about anything. He was Hazel's little spaniel. On Hazel's right was the ear whisperer, Roger Fibbin. He was Hazel's informant, her spy. As Molly looked at him in his crisp white shirt with his tidy hair, she thought how much he looked like a, a shrunken adult. His sharp nose and cold spying eyes were sinister. Rocky and Molly called him the sneak and they called Cynthia and Craig the clones. The nastier things, Hazel said, the more her pack tittered and encouraged her. Gemma and Jerry, friendly seven and six-year-olds, who were quietly sitting on another small table by the dining room door, started to look uneasy. They hated to see Molly bullied, but they were too young to be able to help her. Or did a, did a father attack you because you looked like a bogey-eyed rat, suggested Skinny Roger. Or did a rat attack you because your sweaty hands stink, piped up muscly Gordon. Or did Rocky and you sit in the bushes planning your wedding, jibed Hazel. All at once, Molly smiled. It was a smile that suddenly came from an excitement deep inside her and from the hopes that the hypnotism book had kindled in her. Already, she had daydreamed about what she would be able to do if she learned to hypnotise people. 
Hazel and her posse just better watch out. Without a word, Molly stood up and left the room. She couldn't wait to look at her book, but it was a while before she got a chance. After tea, all the children had to rest on their beds, except for those who were allowed to practice their acts for the Bryersville Talent Competition. Molly was itching to start reading the hypnotism book, but couldn't risk it, as Cynthia was reading a comic on her bed beside her. The minutes crawled by. Molly listened to singing drifting up the stairs. She heard Rocky's husky voice and again hoped he'd win the contest, but she still felt moody about what he'd said, and so she didn't go downstairs and see him. Then came homework hour. It felt like homework year. Miss Addison's cuckoo clock struck six. At Vespers, Molly did her best to avoid Rocky, and so Rocky ignored Molly. After singing a hymn to tape-recorded organ music, Miss Addiston, with her spoilt, overfed pug dog yapping under her arm, made some announcements. The first was that Molly would be on hoovering duty for a week since she had failed to complete the cross-country race. The second was that some American visitors were coming the next day. They will be arriving at four o'clock. May I remind you that they are interested in adopting one of you, strangely enough. If you remember the last time Americans came here, they left empty-handed. Do not let me down this time. I'd like to get rid of one of you at least. They won't be interested in adopting dirty, flea-bitten rat runts. Miss Addiston's eyes hovered on Molly. So clean up. Only a respectable child will be chosen. Some of you, of course, don't need to be told this. Every child in the room felt excited when they heard this news. Molly even detected a glimmer of hope in Hazel's eyes. At supper, Molly sat on her own eating a bruised apple. Finally, when Molly thought she was about to explode from curiosity, she found a moment when her bedroom was empty. Quickly taking the book and the squashed fairy cake from under her mattress, she hid them in her laundry bag and set off to find a place to read. Hades means hell in Greek. This was the orphanage name for the infant infrequently visited laundry rooms that were deep in the bowels of the building. Molly made her way down to them now, looking as if she was off to do some washing. The washing cellars were dark, with low ceilings. The walls were lined with rusty pipes that hung with drying clothes, so that the cellars were warm at least. At the far end were some old porcelain sinks with limescale covered plug holes, where the children washed their laundry. Molly found a warm spot under a light bulb below some drying pipes and bursting with anticipation, she reached inside her laundry bag. All her life, she yearned to be special. She'd fantasized that she was special and that one day something miraculous would happen to her. Deep down inside, she felt that one day a brilliant Molly Moon would burst out and show everyone at Hardwick House that she really was a somebody. Yesterday she thought something important was going to happen. Maybe the important thing was a day late. All evening Molly had wondered whether this book was going to make her dreams come true and her mind had raced about what it might teach her. Perhaps Molly's imagination had stretched a little too far. It was with trepidation and a timid hand that she slowly lifted the dry leather cover of the old book. It opened with a creak. There was the first page again. Hypnotism. An ancient art explained. Molly turned to the second page. What she read made her tingle from head to toe. Dear reader, Welcome to the wonderful world of hypnotism and congratulations for making 
the wise decision to open this book. You are about to depart on an incredible journey. If you put into practice the following nuggets of wisdom, you will find that the world is full of golden opportunities. Bon voyage and bon chance. Signed, Dr. Logan, Bryasno, February the 3rd, 1908. Molly noticed with amazement that Dr. Logan had come from Briarsville. This was extraordinary, as sleepy Briarsville didn't have many interesting people to boast of. She eagerly turned the page. Introduction. You have probably heard often enough of the ancient art of hypnotism. Perhaps you have seen a performing hypnotist in a travelling fair, hypnotising members of the audience, getting to them to uh, behave in peculiar ways and amuse spectators. Maybe you have read statements of how people have been hypnotised for operations, so they feel no pain. Hypnotism is a great art form, and like other art forms, hypnotism is something that most people can learn, if they are patient and practice hard. A few students of hypnotism will have a natural talent. Even fewer will have a real gift. Will you be one of the gifted few? Read on. Molly's hands began to sweat. Hypnotism, the book read, was given its name by the ancient Greeks. Hypnos means sleep in Greek. Hypnotists have practiced since the earliest of times. Hypnotism is also known as mesmerism, a word that came from the name of a doctor called Franz Mesmer. He was born in 1734 and died in 1815, and his chief pursuit in life was the art of hypnotism. When a person is under the powers of a hypnotist, they are in a trance. People go into trances all the time without realising it. When you put your pen down, for instance, and one minute later can't remember where you put it, you can't remember because you were in a small trance. Daydream. Daydreaming is another form of entering a trance. People daydreaming are in a world of their own, and when they come out of their daydream trance, they often don't know what people around them have been saying or doing. In trances, people's thoughts float away from the noisy world into the quieter places of the mind. Molly thought of the trick she learnt of drifting off into space and looking down at the world, of turning herself off when people were shouting at her, Maybe, without knowing it, she had been putting herself into a trance. The book continued. Our minds like to relax in this way as a rest from thinking. Trances are very normal things. When Molly read the next sentence, her heart stip skipped a beat. If you are good at going into trances, the chances are you will be very good at hypnotism. Hungrily, she read on. What a hypnotist does is bring people into trances and then keep them there by talking to them in a hypnotic way. When the person is in a deep trance, a sort of wide-awake sleep, the hypnotist can then suggest things that the person should think or do. For instance, the hypnotist might say, When you wake up, you will not want to smoke another pipe. Or, when you wake up, you will no longer feel afraid of riding in automobiles. Molly put the book down for a moment. Or, she thought aloud, when you wake up, you will think you're a monkey. Molly smiled as ideas began to jostle through her head. Then a shiver of suspicion stopped her in her tracks. Was this book for real or was it written by a madman? Molly considered this as she flicked through the pages. Chapter 1, Practicing on Yourself. Chapter 2, Hypnotizing Animals. Chapter 3, Hypnotizing Others. Chapter 4, Pendulum Hypnosis. Chapter 5, Hypnotizing Small Groups of People. Chapter 6, How to Hypnotize a Crowd. Chapter 7, Hypnotizing Using the Voice Alone. Chapter 8, Long Distance Hypnosis. Chapter 9, Amazing Feats of Hypnosis. The book was peppered with drawings of people in Victoria clothes, showing examples of positions for hypnosis. There was a picture of a woman lying flat with only a chair under her head and her feet. She was called the human plank. There were lots of strange diagrams of a man making all sorts of faces, one with a puffed up 
bluefish face, another with it where his eyes were turned upwards, showing their whites. Yuck, disgusting, Molly thought. As she turned the thick pages of the heavy old book, Molly came to the end of chapter six and realised it was immediately followed by chapter nine. Two chapters. Chapter seven, hypnotising using the voice alone, and chapter eight, long distance hypnosis, had been carefully removed. Huh. Molly wondered who'd taken the pages and wondered whether they'd gone missing years ago or only recently. It was impossible to tell. Then she remembered the warthoggy man in the library. He said he'd travelled all the way from America just to find this book. The professor must believe that the secrets contained between its covers were extremely valuable. It must be very, very special. Perhaps, Molly thought to herself, perhaps she chanced on a real treasure. Near the end of the book were some pages of brownish photographs. One was of a man with curly hair and glasses and a bulbous nose. Dr. Logan, the world's most famous hypnotist, it said underneath. Molly was relieved to see that you obviously didn't need to be a great beauty to be a good hypnotist. Eagerly, she flicked back to the first chapter, Practice on Yourself. The first heading was voice. It read, A hypnotist's voice must be gentle, calm, lulling, like a mother's hand, rocking a baby to sleep, so the hypnotist's voice must lull the subject into a trance. This sounded too good to be true. Molly had been labelled with the nickname Drono because people said her voice made them, want to, made them want to go to sleep. Now this ability, instead of being something to be ashamed of, felt like a talent to boast about book went on. Here are some exercises which must be said slowly and steadily. Practice them. Molly read the sentences out loud. I have a wonderful calm voice. I am calm and persuasive. My voice is very... All of a sudden she heard loud steps. She shut the book quickly, slipped it into her laundry bag, and pulled out her squashed chocolate fairy cake. Hazel was coming into Hades. She stamped noisily into the pipe room with her tap shoes, tap shoes still on. Ugh, she said. What are you doing hanging out in here, weirdo? I heard you trying to sing. Give up, your voice is flat. Just singing while I find my socks, said Molly. More like you're down here thinking how everyone dislikes you. Hazel collected her hockey kit from a high pipe and turned to look at Molly. You're like a sock, aren't you, Drono? A weird, worn out, stinking, unwanted, weird sock. Why don't you enter the talent competition as a sock? Or better still, enter as the ugliest person in the world. And shuddering, she added, Ugh, oh, I bet your parents were really ugly. Bogey eyes. When Molly didn't react, Hazel added, Oh, and by the way, you missed your dimwit stinking trinklebury today. With a satisfied smirk, she turned and walked away. Molly watched her. She smiled to herself and took a nibble of her fairy cake. Under her breath, she said, Just you wait, Hazel Haggersley. Just you wait. And that is the end of... I've got to get it right. I think last time I got it wrong. Yes, that is the end of chapter four. I hope you enjoyed that and um, tomorrow I'll read you chapter 5.